My name is Tori Whitaker Martinez, and I'm the senior editor for Infection Control Today. And today I am here with Saskia Popescu, who is the assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you. Yeah, me too. Thank you. As an infection preventionist, what do you see are some key rare infectious diseases that IPs, EBS personnel, serial processing personnel should be aware of that you believe pose a significant risk um, and why should we be vigilant about them? So it's kind of a complex question and answer if you think about it, because we have the things that we worry about every day. So multi-drug resistant organisms, you know, Candida auris is a really big one right now, especially multi-drug resistant Candida auris, because this is considered an emerging threat, an emerging infectious disease, and especially challenging when we can't treat it. Um, so diagnostics can be a little rough and challenging for us. So that means knowing that the patient has the infection and then ensuring that they're in isolation or using the proper disinfection and cleaning protocols. Those are really, really important. So, you know, that's an emerging infectious disease threat, if you will, but overall, multi-drug resistant organisms are something it's, I hate to say it, it's the bread and butter of what we deal with in infection prevention. We see it all the time, but that doesn't mean it's any less concerning and any less challenging for us to actually address. So those are the day-to-day -day things I think of, you know, we've got C. diff, we've got measles right now, which is actually on the rise in the U.S. and in the U.K., you know, we're seeing pretty significant surges of these. We had a nice little lull of it during COVID, and unfortunately, that was also matched with drops in childhood vaccination rates. So now we're kind of in this perfect situation to see outbreaks and clusters of measles, which is really, really contagious. And having worked a few of those outbreaks, I can tell you from the IP perspective, it is extremely time consuming, extremely taxing, and can be really, you know, dangerous for people who are unvaccinated. So those are the, on one hand, and then on the other side of the spectrum, when we think about things we should worry about that maybe we're not talking about enough, I think emerging infectious diseases that we don't really see in the United States, meaning they're not really endemic here, is one that we've really learned a lot of lessons from in the last 10 to 15 years. So we had SARS-CoV-1 in 2002. We saw that in China and Toronto. We've had MERS in 2012. And then, you know, we had Ebola in 2014. We had, the, you know, the first U.S.-based diagnostic case of Ebola in Dallas, Texas. And we've had H1N1 in 20, um, 2009. And we just lived through a pandemic. So we are seeing this increasing risk of emerging infectious diseases of zoonotic origin, meaning these are animal-borne diseases that are spilling over into human populations. So the ones that I'm really keeping an eye on, and I think a lot of us are increasingly worried about, are things like Nipah virus and Hendra, but definitely Nipah. So Nipah virus, Hendra and Nipah are actually from the same genus, but these are diseases that we really, you know, we're not seeing in the United States, but Nipah uh, we first saw in 1999 in a pretty significant outbreak in Malaysia, but we are seeing consistent cases in Bangladesh and in India. And Hendra, thankfully, we don't see much of, this was actually first found in the mid-90s in Brisbane, Australia, in a suburb actually. So they both originate in animals actually in flying foxes. And then that spills out into another, you know, kind of intermediary species. In the case of Nipah, it's pigs. So if you actually watch the movie Contagion, that very last scene where you see the bat and it drops the fruit, it gets the pig sick, and then the pig spreads it to the humans, that's that was based on Nipah virus. So I worry about these because while Hendra, we really don't see that much of, it can spread, um, you know, it can be highly risky for people working with animals who are, you know, taking care of them and they have, you know, really significant flu-like symptoms and the case fatality rate is really high. So that's why I worry about Hendra. That's a lower risk thing, but NEPA, we are seeing more and more cases of, and it has a fatality rate of 40 to 70%. And these are challenging because they're mostly spread through contaminated blood and bodily fluids. But in the case of NEPA, we have seen healthcare transmission in cases of people taking care of family members. So we do know that it's not just about risk in, from your interaction with animals. It's also potential for a healthcare setting. And the other one that I would definitely worry about, and again, these are kind of these 
more rare emerging infectious diseases, but it's Crimean um, Congo hemorrhagic fever. And this is actually pretty widespread. I think when we talk about emerging infectious diseases, people are like, oh, that's probably only in some tiny little country that I'll never go to and we don't need to worry about. I think we can wipe that sentiment off the map because we have effectively seen these events occur from time to time and they're very impacting. But Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, we have a precedent of healthcare transmission due to poor sterilization technique. And it's actually, it's a tick-borne disease and it's spread through ticks, but you can get it through contaminated blood and bodily fluids. And as I mentioned, there have been cases related to poor sterilization. And this disease isn't isolated to some small little country that you might not ever go to, but we actually see it in Eastern Europe, you know, across Asia, Russia, um, there are, you know, a lot of cases throughout Africa. So it is, you know, in the Middle East as well, we, it's pretty, it has a pretty decent distribution. Um, those are probably the big emerging infectious diseases I worry about outside of um, Ebola and Marburg too. So the viral hemorrhagic fevers, but those, it's tough. So to your point, we have the ones that we deal with kind of every day that we probably don't give enough attention to, like those really increasingly resistant infections and the re-emerging vaccine preventable diseases. But then we have the zoonotic pathogens that we are increasingly seeing outbreaks of because we are you know, encroaching on animal habitats and we're seeing degradation of forests and wildlife. So it's, it's a complex answer. <laughs> Yeah, you're not kidding. The tough part is that, you know, if we only stuck to one disease, we'd be doing our staff a disservice. And even if the likelihood of Nipah virus showing up in your hospital is extremely low, I would rather we talk about it and have plans for a response because it's actually a very manageable disease from an IPC perspective. We, you know, we can easily put those protocols in place. And now even with Ebola, much more complicated to handle, but we have protocols. We have a tiered hospital system within the UNES, um, but we have to make sure people know about it. We have to make sure they have the resources to adequately respond and communicate it. And that's why Rare Disease Month is so important so that we can get this information out there. Speaking of that, how do you, how does the average Joe IP stay informed about emerging or re-emerging pathogens? Um, first and foremost, one of my favorites is ProMed. This is a free online um, information service about outbreaks that are reported globally. So it's a, it's a really lovely kind of open source intelligence system that we've used. Um, and it actually really had a big place with SARS-1 with COVID-19, you know, it's a lot of a lot of people who work in outbreak response who maybe don't work internationally or work in healthcare. This is sometimes that little email alert from ProMed might be the first indication that something is starting. So I love it. It's free. I highly encourage you to register for the email. It's a wonderful resource that I wish we gave more credit to. So I would say ProMed, the CDC's website is so helpful. You know, they are constantly doing news alerts and, you know, little outbreak overviews in the MMWRs or the morbidity mortality weekly reports. Um, you know, I, I'm hesitant to say social media simply because we know that misinformation and disinformation is so prevalent, but there's often a great resource with SIDRAP. So that's out of the University of Minnesota and their School of Public Health. They're really, really wonderful in that regard. Um, and if you have some, you know, trusted infectious disease colleagues that you can ping from time to time and ask like, hey, have you heard anything? That's always helpful. But I really encourage people to sign up for some really helpful email listservs. And, you know, even if you are on social media, follow SIDRAP, follow ProMed, um, you know, follow the CDC and WHO. Those are all really wonderful resources where you know you're getting accurate information. And that's probably the most important piece. Would you provide some examples of rare diseases that may require specific infection control measures beyond standard protocols? And how do you ensure that your team is adequately trained to address these unique challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think the one that really comes to mind is definitely Ebola, actually, because there's such a high level of PPE, of donning and doffing protocols, of waste management 
and cleaning and disinfection. So to me, that is the highest level because there are so many moving pieces in it. And if you can train your teams and make them comfortable with those processes, comfortable with the protocols, the donning, the doffing, and knowing what to do, or at least where to find the resources, that is a really nice top tier level of readiness that anything else will probably not be as, as burdensome, I want to say, because, you know, even when we look at novel respiratory pathogens like COVID-19, that is not the same level of PPE because, you know, Ebola is so, so infectious that you have to be very, very careful. You have to have the, you know, the designated donning and doffing rooms and going in and out. And the PPE is very exhausting and hot. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very time consuming. So I use Ebola as kind of this like gold standard for if we can do that, and it's, it involves so much in terms of engineering controls, cleaning and disinfection, that waste management I mentioned, PPE, just communication, everything, then everything else will just be either a little bit less or different in a way that we'll know what to do essentially. So I like using Ebola as a metric, but I also really encourage people to train around disease X. So when we were designing high consequence disease readiness programs in hospitals, we looked at three pillars, if you will. Preparing for something like Ebola, so a viral hemorrhagic fever, that's really all about um, blood and bodily fluids and very PPE intensive. A respiratory pathogen, so this was actually pre-COVID when we were designing this, and we were really looking at SARS-1 and MERS and looking at those that would require N95s, eye protection, you know, likely a gown and gloves, but you're really focusing on negative pressure rooms. And then disease X, which is what the WHO uses to kind of signify this disease we don't know yet, that we are likely going to see at some point that's a novel pathogen, and we're going to kind of have to learn as we go, which sounds a little on the nose because we just lived through that with COVID-19. But nonetheless, I think that's nice because you're looking at all the different ways diseases are likely transmitted and that we have to kind of create infection control protocols around, you know, using those of CDC and WHO but within our healthcare system. So you've got viral hemorrhagic fevers, you've got respiratory pathogens, and then you've got this unknown, which means you have to be really agile and flexible. And that's, that's kind of the three pillar approach that I really like. And WHO is doing a lot of great work now around readiness in terms of looking at how diseases are transmitted and building better, more, you know, kind of holistic and robust interventions around transmission dynamics and not necessarily the disease itself. So if you think about disease agnostic approaches, I like that. And that's what I would definitely recommend. So, you know, using the lessons of Ebola, of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, and then an unknown to really test people's capacity to change protocols if they need to. That's the best strategy, I think, because it's, you're giving everyone the best chance of success and you're making sure they feel comfortable with the highest level of stress and knowing that hopefully it's not going to be as bad. What advice do you give to IPs, EVS, SPDs? What do you what advice do you give to them about rare diseases and what you want them to know when they step into their facility every day? Talk about them ask questions. So for the IEP, become the biggest nerd on these things. First of all, no one expects you to know everything. I'm a big believer in saying, you know what, let me double check that and get back to you. Because there's a lot of weird intricacies, especially with really rare pathogens. It's, it's going to be with novel pathogens. And I think we all became experts during COVID-19 of saying, this is likely going to change. Here's the protocol today. And, you know, let me get back to you on that. So from the IP perspective, I think it's just about staying well-informed and knowing that there's going to be some sense of kind of agility that you will need to have. I, that's my word of the day, clearly. But I think for infection preventionists, we have to be able to think on our feet to modify things to fit the needs of our communities. And obviously, we need to stick to the safety protocols that are in place for isolation and quarantine. But we also really need to be able to say, okay, so if I don't have negative pressure in this space, how do I get it that way? Or how do I move this patient to that, to that negative pressure room? And in terms of, you know, our other healthcare workers, our critical ancillary staff like EVS, 
I think it's so important to just ask questions and communicate. One of the first questions we always had during training before we had anyone talk about putting on PPE or even think about it was, what are you most scared of? What do you worry about? And that gave a really nice forum for us to have frank conversations about what their concerns are, because what worries us as an IP is likely going to be very different than what you know, someone in the emergency department is concerned about, or someone, you know, an EVS is worried about. All of our interactions are very unique and different. So giving people the space to express their concerns, answer them, and making sure they feel heard and respected is huge. But also that we have plans in place. This isn't just like us throwing a binder at them and saying, good luck, we'll see how it turns out. No, we actually have protocols, we have resources, and we will be with you every step of the way. I think that's probably the biggest piece is letting them know it's a safe place to come ask us questions. I always encourage people, if you can ask a question that stumps me and I have to go back and research, I'm going to come back with an answer and probably like a little hand sanitizer or some candy, because I love that. I love when we can create a situation where people are asking really insightful questions and we get to communicate and engage with each other further. So I think that would probably be the biggest recommendation. I love the candy idea. That's amazing. Anything to encourage it and and show that it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to to not know. And 100%. Yeah. When I was teaching, um I taught at a local university and when I taught there were so many people who just refused to ask questions or they would ask questions afterwards. And I'm like, if you have this question, then inevitably someone else in the classroom also has that question. So don't hesitate to ask, you know, and this is the same situation. And I wish I would have thought about the candy situation because that would have been amazing. (laughs) I just, I think it's so important to have an open door policy. And that's why also when we're doing rounds on units, it's a really nice time for people to pop by and ask a question. So I really like to use rounds um, and, and time on the floor to not just, you know, do our infection control kind of compliance checks, not just, you know, look at doing central line rounds and CAUTI rounds, but in PPE, but also use that as a time to say like, hey, do you guys have any questions about, you know, this outbreak that's going on over here in XYZ or any questions about what we're doing to prepare for, you know, a potential outbreak in the future? You know, that can be kind of a nice space to ask. So I really, I think it takes time to build that rapport with staff and to ensure that they feel comfortable with it, but really creating an open door policy. And that's not just, you know, obviously to your office, but to you as a person and you as a department is so important. And I love that. I love if we can kind of all geek out together because that means people feel comfortable. They're thinking about these things. And I hope that it instills a little bit of trust and Uh, for them to know that we're also thinking about these. We're also ensuring that there are policies and protocols in place. And it's, it's okay if they don't know, because you're the ones who are supposed to know. You're not the bad Mm -hmm. guys. You, you know, you're the experts. You're the ones that they're supposed to go to. Do you have anything else you would like to add? You know, I, I think when we're talking to different departments and different folks about these topics, It can be really easy to just be like, oh, but, you know, we won't have to worry about it. I think there's a sense of saying, you know, this disease isn't something we have really seen in the U.S., but that doesn't mean we're not preparing for it is a a better strategy because I don't want people to ever live in a state of fear, but I also don't want us to ever be so complacent that we're not preparing ourselves because this is what we experienced in 2014 with Ebola. We just lived through a pandemic now of a respiratory pathogen and these events are not going to stop. You know, we had an unprecedented MPOX outbreak in 2022. And these are things that we've just not really dealt with in the US. So I want, you know, there's there's a really challenging line to straddle in terms of communicating risk, but also ensuring that people are staying vigilant, but know that we have plans in place and we are working towards those. And I think part of that conversation is also encouraging them to be a part of the conversation, come to the meetings, come to the trainings, even if you're not doing them and you just want to see what they're like. Because what I have found is that we as infection preventionists can come up with like the coolest protocols and use the CDC and WHO guidance, like we're champions at that. 
But if it's a department that we don't work in, having that person say, actually, this is how that task is done. Or, you know, in this case, we'd actually go to this part of the hospital or, you know, use this product, et cetera. All of those things really do change. And it's so helpful to have someone in that role participating or observing that can improve our measures and, you know, improve our response. So that's why I love getting engagement in that way. Even if you want to come and you have no questions to ask, you don't want to speak, that's totally fine. You can observe and you can help us better this process. And I think that's a really, really important piece. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. You're welcome.